civilized, and I got hot and sweaty. So I decided to be uncivilized and not have it on, guys. Hope that doesn't offend you. Um, children, you guys can go to children's church. And uh, I guess we got some that are going to children's church here today. You know where to go, adventurers over here, second grade and under, and third to, I think, fifth grade through the back there to explore. We're going to be in John chapter 15, and I've been looking forward uh, to this chapter. We do not make tracks to get to our favorite parts of Scripture at El Paso Bible Church, because the parts that are not necessarily our favorites are still foundational, absolutely necessary to good understanding of everything. Uh, And so sometimes we lay a lot of groundwork. We spend a lot of time doing that. Chapter 14 is like that when we come into chapter 15. John chapter 15 is probably one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture. It's one of the most important for us as believers to understand. It is one that very few people understand properly. The evidence of that is just listen to somebody teach 1 John. Because 1 John is an exposition, really, of John 15. And if they don't understand John 15, they will not have a clue what 1 John teaches. They are exactly the same topic, 1 John being a little longer, John 15 being spoken to people that do not have the Holy Spirit permanently indwelling them yet. But let's start off at the very beginning, understanding what John 15 is talking about and to whom it is speaking. The subject is the disciples, the believing disciples. Whether you agree with me or not that Judas was an Old Testament saint prior to his betrayal of Jesus Christ and is therefore eternally justified, this passage is written to people who clearly do believe in Jesus, who possess eternal life. The distinction that is going to be made in John chapter 15 then, no part of this is written to distinguish false believers, what we call unbelievers, false believers with true believers. So if you hear somebody preaching on 1 John or John chapter 15 and they begin by making the distinction between people who think they're going to heaven when they die but aren't and people that are going to heaven when they die, they are wrong. That clear? The distinction that is being made in John chapter 15 is not between people who think they're going to heaven when they die and aren't and people that are. The distinction is between believers who abide in Christ and therefore produce fruit. They do the things Jesus asked them to do, and therefore they receive, they produce fruit in Jesus' picture. The distinction is between those who abide in Christ and those who don't. No part of John 15 is talking about false believers versus true believers. Also, no part of 1 John is talking about false believers and true believers. So this is why this is so important. 99% of the messages and the teaching that I have heard on 1 John is completely wrong. Because they begin with the presupposition that John is talking at some point to people who think they are believers and who aren't, or unbelievers and believers, when in fact the distinction is between two types of believers. Those who abide and those who don't. John 15 is foundational to this. But he begins with a picture. Remember, Jesus has been kind of on a discourse with his disciples. Their hearts had been troubled. Actually, Jesus' heart had been troubled before that. And then Satan left the room (laughs) with Judas, and his heart was at peace. But the disciples' hearts were troubled, and he's been explaining to them how not to have troubled hearts. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's the key to peace. Peace produces joy. And now he's telling them, this is your responsibility. This is the commandment that you are to keep. And in the overarching terms, disciples of Jesus, he says, abide in me. That's what he's going to tell them. We need to love Jesus. It gives us peace. We experience joy and obedience. And this is how to do that. And he begins with a very familiar picture. It's not familiar to most of you. I personally am a grapevine killer. I don't know how many grapevines I have killed in my yard in the last two years, but it is more than I care to admit. But when Jesus says this, 
I am the true vine. This is, I mean, this was tremendously familiar. This is like saying, I am a plate of green enchiladas in El Paso. Everybody here, if you don't, I don't know where you're from, but you should know what a plate of green enchiladas looks like. We immediately have context. We immediately know it could be good, it could be bad. But he says, this is the true vine. You talk to Jacob, he believes that nobody in El Paso produces true green enchiladas. Nobody, except for his wife. We'll give him that, right over. We don't want to get him in trouble now. This is an immediate picture they understand. They understand what it looks like for grapevines to grow, for bad grapevines to grow, for good grapevines. True vine has some meaning to it. But Jesus is clearly making a metaphor. I, I am the true vine. And the Father, my Father, who I am going to, He is the vine dresser. What that means is that Jesus ultimately is the one producing the fruit and it is the Father's care and the Father's plan and His actions that are responsible for fostering that in Him. It's as His plan. See, the vine dresser was not like a tomato grower. You know, in some places in the world, tomatoes are perennials. That means they just grow and grow and grow, kind of like an evergreen bush or an Afghan pine, you know, here. But here they're not. You've got to plant them three times a year if you want any tomatoes. So if you decide you don't want to do it anymore, you just stop. You don't plant them again. Well, a vine dresser doesn't get that option. Now, there's rootstock being sold here in El Paso that's 100 years old for grapevines. All over the world, old grapevines continue to persist. There's a long-term commitment, a year-round commitment. You don't get to move them into a greenhouse in the winter and forget about them. Constant process of care, and, and it's valuable. I, like I said, I don't know how many grapevines I've killed, but I had to give up. My checkbook said, stop growing grapevines. Stop trying, dummy. God doesn't have that perspective. He's the vine dresser. It's what he does. This is his plan. This is his commitment. The same setting here. Jesus is going to talk about this. He pictures his vineyard, the parameters. The fruit is to be produced by and through and in Jesus Christ by the Father's plan and his care. Now this is important. Who created grapes? God. That, that's real important to this passage. God knows what a grapevine looks like. You may be confused. You, you may look at a muskmelon vine and say, that's a grapevine. But that's because you're dumb and you didn't make them. I, I'm dumb. I mean, truthfully. Because you can't recognize the difference between all the other vines and, and a grapevine. But God knows. God created the thing. He recognizes the grapes, the grapevine, the fruitfulness, all of it. It feels very important. We're going to get back to that in a minute. But this, this is a long-term commitment. Not summer squash, not tomatoes. It's year-round care. And in the Old Testament, that's why I had Bill read from Isaiah 5. And it's God using the same picture of Israel. Israel taken from their captivity as a people and placed into the promised land. And in fact, that was part of their promise. You're going to harvest from vineyards that you didn't even plant. Those vineyards were planted hundreds of years before you were harvesting from them. But he talks about them and he says, in the land, you're going to be planted and you're going to be my vineyard. And I'm going to be the vine dresser. I'm going to be in charge of that. And then by the time Isaiah rolls around, God says, guys, holy smokes. I did everything I could. I did everything that was necessary, and you rejected that. You produced worthless grapes, wild grapes. In the vine dresser's mind, the wild grapes are useless. It's not what he intended to grow but he intended for them, this is not a picture of any individual's justification. Why? Because John's not talking about believers versus unbelievers or false believers versus true believers. He's talking about disciples living in Jesus' absence in a way that is abiding in Christ and therefore fruitful. It's the same thing with Israel. Remember we talked about abiding a while back, you might not remember. It has two parts. Two parts to abiding. Abiding is to rest in my identity, to rest in who I am in Jesus Christ, and to do what he says to do. 
two parts. You can fail at abiding by failing to rest in who I am in Jesus Christ. That's a very common problem among people who do not believe in eternal security. They continue to behave. They continue to modify their behavior for all the wrong reasons because they're trying to continue to curry favor with Jesus Christ and with God himself. And therefore, their behavior is oriented towards this. They're spinning their wheels. And God is not honoring their obedience. It's not indicative of love for Jesus Christ. It's indicative of a failure to rest. Other people are able to rest, but they refuse to obey, and it short-circuits the fruitfulness process. That's what we're going to get into here. That's what Israel had done. They had been given everything they needed to do. They failed to rest in their identity as the chosen nation of God and wasted all of that effort in the land. how to live our lives on this earth, specifically to the disciples of Jesus in his absence, how to serve others, how to love God, how to live in peace and joy, and how to abide in him. I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me, trouble starts right here for most people. They think that there are all these other branches They think there are grapevines growing in God's vineyard that are not in Christ. Now remember, you're dumb. You don't know the difference between all the vines. Who made the grapes? God did. Do you think God knows the difference between the branches in his vineyard? I think so. Every branch in me, people skip over the in me part. Nowhere in Scripture is in me applied to a a false believer, someone who thinks they're going to heaven when they die and they don't. Scripture never does that. We humans have screwed up Scripture in order to say that. When Scripture says that somebody is in Christ, there are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. They are in Christ. And that is who Jesus is saying he's talking about here. So we have no right. We have no right to change the topic. You understand? Yes, we let the text say what the text says. We have no right to change this from every branch that may or may not be in me. He says, every branch that is in me. The identity of the branch is defined by that relationship. It's a grapevine in this illustration. If he were in my yard, he could have said Lufa or tromboncino or something else, but this is a grapevine. This is what's familiar. And he says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. Do you know how many people's entire systematic theology just got turned on their ear by Jesus? Entirely ruined. All of their soteriology. Because most people believe that every branch in Jesus Christ must bear fruit. And if it doesn't bear fruit, it's not a grapevine, it's a dandelion or some other freakish thing in the vineyard. But Jesus doesn't let us go there. This is not some other branch. This is every branch in him. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. And your Bible may say he takes away. My NASB actually says take away. It should have a footnote that says lifts up. This is a technical term in what we call viticulture, in in vine dressing, in vineyard husbandry. If you say this to somebody who grows grapevines for a living in Greece and you say Iro, they know exactly what it means. It means to take a vine that has refused to be trained for a while. A little rebellious. You know, because you, you, when you plant a vine, you provide for a trellis, you provide for it, but sometimes they go off to the side. And while they're little, you take them, take these little twist ties or these little gentle ties that you buy at the nursery and you lift them up onto the trellis. 
And if you were to say that to an ancient Jewish vine dresser, you need to eye roll that grapevine. That is what they would do. They would take that vine that is a little rebellious, that has been rebelling against the training that, that the vine dresser has provided for it, and they correct it, lift it up onto the trellis. Again, whole volumes of systematic theology turned on their ear when we understand what the text is saying. The identity of the branch is in him, and the first topic is a branch in Jesus that does not bear fruit. The father is the vine dresser. He loves the vine. Therefore, he loves all of the branches. And if one of the branches of the true vine does not bear fruit, I mean, remember, these are valuable. Long-term investment of time, money, material, work. He doesn't just snip it off. He lifts it up. If they're not producing fruit, you care for them. You husband them. This is actually how I, how I got into beekeeping. You know why? Because I was able to produce these great summer squash plants. Huge, beautiful, nearly Jurassic looking plant. Massive leaves, huge things, lots of flowers, and no squash. See, y'all thought that I was a beekeeper because I was a dang fool. But I'm not, I might be, but not because I'm a beekeeper. I became a beekeeper because I had a pollination problem. And in a vineyard, if they, if this is how this may happen. That the reason the branch may not bear fruit is on the ground and no pollinators get to it. He puts it on a trellis. All of a sudden, the flowers attract. Pollination. So that they can produce the fruit they were created to produce. Now, it's unfortunate, I think, that a theological prejudice, and I think that's what it is, has made most translations put, take away there. Iro can mean that, but not in a vineyard. It doesn't mean that when we're talking about growing grapes. A good vine dresser. You know, a good vine dresser is not content to just have a little fruit. At least his efforts are not directed towards a, a, a fruiting but poorly fruiting branch. You know, fruit trees, all fruit trees. Now, see, John, John he, he grows a lot of fruit, but he doesn't mean to. <laughs> he doesn't mean to. See, there's processes that you got to do. He has peaches coming out of his ears, but again, it was, it's more of an accident at this point, right, John? It just happens. He hasn't pruned the things, I don't know. Doesn't thin them or whatever. But, but somebody who likes this knows that when you have a good established grapevine, or a fruiting variety of things, you've got to prune it. You, you, you even in some varieties, you thin out the fruit so that the production is solid, uh, so that the fruit doesn't push itself off of the vine and turn itself into worm food before you're ready. But grapes especially have a very structured pruning pattern. Every branch, he says, in me, that does not bear fruit, he lifts up so that it can produce fruit when it hasn't before. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. Now, you know that word prune. Again, it has a technical meaning in the vineyard. It means to prune. When we're talking about people, it gets translated in John chapter 14 as cleanse or clean. And when we were back in John chapter 14 and we saw katharizo applied to the disciples, we said, what did that mean? It meant that they were ready to minister according to the power and the gifts that Jesus Christ would give them. They had their, their feet, their hands, and their head right and ready to go do that. They were katharizo, like the priests of the Old Testament. They were ready this is a great picture. This is where the disciples were. The, the, people, the men that he was speaking to, these were ready. He says, you are already pruned. You are already clean. 
In other words, you've been producing fruit. You've been following behind me. You've been loving me. You've been doing what I told you to do. We're having a little struggle with that right now, but you have produced fruit, and God will not let that go to waste. You're ready to go. He's promising them, you will fulfill this ministry that I've given you. You're already pruned. You're ready to bear more abundantly. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. He, this is a review. He told them that. Every branch, every branch in me, don't forget that part. Every branch in me, he says, that bears fruit, he prunes, he cleans them, he prepares them. Now, what is that a picture of? Okay. Sorry. Sometimes I do ask rhetorical questions. What would it be for God to prune things in your life? Do you, you think that's pleasant? I'll tell you what happens when you prune a fruit tree. John would know this, but he doesn't prune his fruit tree, remember? I'll tell, I'll tell you what, if John were to prune his peach tree, this is what happens. As soon as you prune it... You know what happens? The tree starts to put the branch back. As soon as you cut the branch off, it sends out six, eight little shoots, right? Where It tells me that the tree kind of doesn't like the pruning process. The tree had the branch right where the branch wanted, it wanted the branch to be. It sent off a shoot exactly where it thought it needed it. So is it entirely pleasant to be pruned by God? No? I'm afraid that many people have taken their contemporary view of parenting, which is foolish and dumb, and impressed it upon what God does. Now, I am a caveman parent by most modern standards. That means when Scripture says (laughs) that a father who spares the rod from his son hates him, that I do not completely remove corporal punishment from the picture of my parent. And I'm not even good. You know, Jesus said that to his disciples, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more so the father, right? He's just saying, you guys, are all, you guys all stink at parenting. But even you stinky fathers, if you do not spank your kids, and I'll use that word, You hate them. You hate them. They need to be disciplined. Now to take God and to say he does not apply momentary unpleasant discipline to his children is to say that he hates you as his son. Because some people say, oh yeah, God disciplines me. He holds out an ice cream cone to me over here. He just, he just distracts me. Have you ever seen people try to discipline toddlers that way? It irritates the snot out of me. You can't discipline a toddler that way. They're animals. They are. And the worst thing that you could do for a toddler who is an animal <laughs> is to let him be a 30-year-old animal by always holding out an ice cream cone instead of disciplining the child. Scripture is very clear about that. Discipline comes in when the training is rejected. Remember that? That's why the fruit is is not producing, because the vine dresser gives a trellis right here, and the vine, what does the vine do? He has to discipline it, lift it up, prune it. I just, when people say that God does not apply this type of discipline to people, there's nothing that is less biblical that they can say about God's training and discipline of his children. Is to take some stupid modern parenting idea and try to back flush it into God's disciplinary program. He loves you too much not to discipline his children. 
He does that. God has no son whom he does not chasten. God loves his children. Does God love you? Would, would you reject an interpretation of Scripture that said God hates you? If I were to stand up here and say God hates your guts. Not that any TV preacher will say that, but that's what they're saying. When they say God does not discipline his children this way, he's not applying negative consequences to his children for correction, for training. And people say this. They might as well stand up here and say, with a smile on their face, because there's always a smile, God hates you. He hates his children. God has some sons that he hates. I can't imagine saying that. I know some human fathers who hate their sons. They are awful people by human standards. Don't you dare say that about God. Jesus is the true vine. He is the ultimate source. He is in him. He is ultimately responsible for bringing the fruit to fruition. But Jesus says that we have a role in bringing that fruit to fruition. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. They have submitted to the training the discipline, they produce fruit, they'll produce more fruit. And here is the command. Abide in me. Two parts. To abide, yes. You can disagree, but you'll be wrong. You can go look up the word, and you can find that to abide has two components. There are two pieces that one can fail to abide with. You can fail to rest in who you are in Jesus Christ. The way that you do that is to perhaps doubt your security, doubt the relationship that you have with God, doubt His grace, doubt your security, doubt that He loves you unconditionally. To abide is to rest in who I am in Jesus Christ and to do what He says to do, including to abide. See how that works? To abide in Him means to do those two things. Abide in me and a statement of fact, I in you. As the branch cannot bear of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Now some people will try to say some things that they can't from this passage. We've kind of touched on it. Uh, I don't want you to be caught off guard by it. And the reason... I'm not using hyperbole. Sometimes I do use hyperbole. So does Scripture. (laughs) Paul does that. He says, I wish that they would not just circumcise themselves. I wish that they would completely mutilate themselves. See, Paul was nice like that. He was obviously raised in the South. I'm not using hyperbole when I tell you that the vast majority of people do not understand John 15. They do not understand abiding in Christ. They do not understand the whole book of 1 John. These are massively important pieces of Scripture to get correct. Personally, for you, not getting them correct has the potential to ruin your life. Not ruin your eternal life. You can't, be, you can't lose that by grace through faith, period. Nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And Paul gives us a long list in Romans of those things that can't. It's not exhaustive. Nothing can. That's the whole point. But is your life here and now important to you? It is to me. It wasn't when I was 20. People who are around 20, it gets more important, (laughs) I think, as life goes on. It's never the most important thing. Living a life pleasing to him. Abiding in Christ. These things are, uh, who I am in Jesus Christ is always the most important thing, but our life is not insignificant. We are not just God's earthworms here running around in the dirt. We're his sons. His children. And he's given us this gift of the Holy Spirit to produce something for him, in him, in this life. But one group will say that if you don't produce fruit, and by fruit, whatever it is, the 
the thing that God is producing in your life that is pleasing to him. Uh, some people can't even identify fruit properly. But scripture does that for us. One group will say that if you don't produce fruit, you were a branch, but you're not a branch anymore. Yeah? They'll say, you, you, you were in Christ, but now you're not. Kind of a revolving door justification. We just covered that. That can't happen. Every branch that is in Christ stays in Christ, period, cannot be separated. End of story. It's a gift. A transformational, perfect, complete gift. So once you're a branch in Christ, you are a branch in Christ. Uh, these are people who will teach that you can lose your identity in Jesus Christ, your justification. Some people just say salvation, but we've pointed out that that's not good enough. You've got to specify which salvation. But what they mean is that you can lose your eternal life. That doesn't even fit the image, does it? Downright foolish, actually. Because what do you have? So you've got a branch on your peach tree. And you cut it off. And you hold it in your hand. And someone says, what kind of branch is that? What do you say? It's a peach branch. It's still a peach branch. Yes? This goes over to James, by the way. People screw up James all the time. They say dead faith means faith that was never true, never real. Well, let me explain something to you. Y'all walk up and down these train tracks? Every once in a while, I do sometimes. Isaac and I do because we feel like suffering. And every once in a while, we'll see a dead dog. Now, what do we say when we look at the dead dog? There's a dog. It's dead. Does the fact that it's dead mean that it was not a dog or is no longer a dog? No, it's a dog. It's truly a dog. It's truly a dog that isn't doing very many doggy things. So no matter what, once the branch is in him, it's a branch. A grapevine branch. No matter what happens to it, whether it produces fruit or not, that's the topic. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, so that it may bear more fruit. There is nowhere that a grapevine branch becomes something else. And the definition of the grapevine branch is something that is in Christ. There are many passages that conflict with that interpretation, but it just doesn't even fit the metaphor. Now others, like we've talked about, want to make some, frankly, foolish and silly distinction between what they will call a professing believer. They think they're being very cute They'll say that they're professors but not possessors. And they'll say it just like that. Their double chin will rattle. These are professing believers but not possessing believers. All right, like that. Oh. As if there, there, there's a difference, as if there's a third category. There's unbelievers, professing believers, and true believers. Well, Scripture is, that's foreign to Scripture. If you are a professor but not a possessor, that just leaves you in the other category, which is unbeliever. But they'll try to say that there's a professing believer. and Again, nowhere in Scripture is anybody who's not actually justified ever said to be in Christ. That is a permanent, irrevocable, completed, perfect relationship. But they'll try to say that only a true believer produces fruit and a fake one won't. Both really like, really like to keep that verse take away instead of lift up. That's the prejudice there. They wanna, it's not perfect. It doesn't give them a slam dunk, but it leaves enough ambiguity that they can say that this changes the grapevine's nature, the branch nature. Of course, the main problem with that, as we pointed out, is that Jesus does not make that distinction. Did I miss something? The only topic here is branches that are in him. We're not talking about dandelion branches or loofah branches or cedar branches or peach branches, apple branches. 
quince branches. I'm trying to name all the trees John has, but I can't do it. He's got lots of trees that he doesn't even like anymore. Lots of branches. We're not talking about all the other branches. We don't give a, a, a flip about all those other branches. We don't care about all those other branches. All we're talking about is every branch that is in Jesus Christ. Fruitful branches, unfruitful branches. Jesus makes no such third distinction. Now, he treats them differently. Some people think that this is unfair. They think some things like rewards are unfair. They think that this is unfair. The reason he treats them differently is because they have different needs. Yeah? Some people spend their whole life, 60 years before they become to Jesus Christ, and they're in abusive relationship after abusive relationship. They're addicted to 14 substances. They can't get their life together at all. And talking to that branch is a whole lot different than somebody that has spent every Sunday from their waking Days of their earliest childhood memory at El Paso Bible Church being fostered in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Treating the first person like the second person is not only unfair, it's totally incompetent. It's foolish. You can't treat them the same. So a branch that has never borne any fruit needs different treatment than one who is starting to bear fruit. It's not an issue of justice, it's an It's an issue of affection and concern for individuals. But really, some people's interpretation of this passage, they're really treating God's vineyard as if there's a lot of weeds growing in it. And and more than that, this is how screwy it gets. They, sorry, I'm a pastor, I'm not supposed to say that, but that's what it is. It's messed up. They treat God's vineyard like there's weeds growing all over the place, and worse than that, they're treating it like God doesn't know the difference until the weeds don't produce grapes. Isn't that dumb? Didn't we start out saying that God made the grapevines? That he knows them? Don't you think God knows the difference between a human being bearing his image and a cute little puppy dog? And what each is supposed to be doing? God knows the difference. He doesn't need to wait. See, if you go in my backyard right now, it looks like there's all sorts of crop circles back there. You know why? Because I've got puncture vines everywhere right now. I had them under control last year. The only way that I can find to get rid of them is to burn a snot out of them. Little little round circles. It's easier to find them when they had the yellow flowers on them. But I can tell the difference before. If you wait till the little yellow flowers on them, you've already got the fruit of the puncture vine in your yard. God doesn't have to wait for the weeds to bring up their not grapes to know that there are weeds. There are no weeds in this vineyard. But that's how people treat it. This isn't talking about God distinguishing between weeds and grapevines or unbelievers and believers or professing believers and true believers. The difference is between an abiding believer and a non-abiding believer, or I guess actually the non-abiding believer and the abiding believer. He talks about the non-abiding believer first. It's about how God provides for those that are in the true vine to fulfill their God-honoring, pleasing purpose in him. The disciples, as we pointed out, are in the latter group. They, They were abiding at that point. They had produced fruit, and they had more still to produce. They... They had been clean because of the word that was spoken to them, to minister, to love Jesus, to obey his commandments, to have peace, to have joy, to produce fruit pleasing to him. And they would continue to do that as long as they abided in Christ. We're going to take this slow, four verses today. But the key that I want you to remember, the difference in John 15 between 
the non-abiding believer, the abiding believer. The, the non-fruit producing believer and the fruit producing believer. And what makes the difference between those two is whether they are abiding in Christ. And abiding in Christ, resting in who I am, doing what he says to do. That's simple enough. I've been told that I can only make one point if I'm to be an effective preacher. I think that's all one point. I don't really care about effectiveness as long as you remember. I, don't care, I mean, what I don't care what the books say about me being effective. Non-abiding believer, abiding believer. No fruit, fruit. The difference, abiding. And that's the whole topic of John 15, is this abiding in Christ. Let's pray.